Welcome everyone. Uh, we are starting uh, the, liver, the HIV and liver section. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we have, we'll have five presentations of 10 minutes, followed by uh, five minutes for discussion of each paper. We encourage you after uh, the presentation to come to the microphone, introduce yourselves self, and ask questions for the presenters. I'm Hugo Perazzo. I'm a hepatologist working in Fiocruz, Brazil, and uh, I'll co-chair this session with my colleague. Dr. Marina Klein. I'm from McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and I am uh, currently a governing board member of the International AIDS Society and co-chair of the Co-Infections and Comorbidities Working Group. And it's really my pleasure today to start off this session, which has a really nice diversity of talks around issues related to both viral hepatitis and to the liver. It's my pleasure to present the next speaker, Dr. Yu Lin. He's a clinician, a clinical researcher in HIV AIDS, member of the Taiwan HIV Study Group and the National Young Ming University. He present us today less severe but prolonged course of acute hepatitis A in HIV positive patients than HIV negative patients during an outbreak, a mood center observational study. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure here to uh, <coughs> present our uh, uh, study in this conference. Uh, the topic of my uh, presentation is about the different presentation of acute, H, uh, acute hepatitis A between uh, HIV positive and the HIV negative patients during, uh, the, during an outbreak. Uh, the background is uh, 15 years ago, <coughs> a paper was published in Clinical Infectious Disease by uh, Professor Oka. The study was conducted in Japan, and uh, they want to uh, Investigate, investigate, investigate the influence of uh, HIV on acute HIV infection. It was a case control study. They compared 15 to 15 uh, patients, uh, 15 with uh, HIV infection and uh, 15 without HIV infection. When they have HIV, acute uh, hepatitis A, uh, is there any, any difference uh, presentation between these two groups? Uh, they have found that compared to HIV negative patients, HIV, <coughs> HIV positive patients uh, had low, lower uh, ALT and the higher uh, HIV uh, viremia during the acute stage of HIV. Uh, however, the HIV positive patients will have longer course of HIV viremia. That's uh, 53 uh, days versus 22 days compared to the HIV negative patients in a covid uh, stage of HIV. <coughs> Although the extraordinary results, uh, the major limitation of their study is the small sample, uh, small sample size. They, are unable, uh, they were unable to address the different uh, HIV status on the HIV presentation. And, and in the uh, last uh, 15 years, there was no another study could uh, repeat or reproduce the results until the outbreak in Taiwan. As Dr. Lin, Dr. Lin uh, mentioned in that section, <coughs> uh, Taiwan uh, experienced a huge outbreak in the last two years. We have more than uh, 1,500 indigenous cases in Taiwan, and the more than 60% uh, uh, were HIV, uh, had HIV infection. Uh, it gives us a unique opportunity to, uh, to study uh, the issue about the interaction between HIV and HIV infection. So we uh, start a multi-center observational study <coughs> in 14 uh, hospitals around Taiwan uh, in the last two years. A total of near 300 patients were included. Uh, 60% uh, were HIV positive and 40 was HIV negative. Uh, their symptoms and signs, the validity data, imaging studies, and the disease codes were collected for, compa for comparison. <laughs> the demographic results we can see uh, more than 90% of patients were male, uh, either uh, HIV. Uh, uh, both HIV positive and the HIV negative, especially the HIV positive patients, 100% were male. Uh, 
And then there are very high proportion of them are MSM. We can see from the, uh, the table, uh, more than 90% uh, of HIV positive uh, patient was an MSM. For the comorbidities, uh, in this uh, in this outbreak, we found rare uh, traditional uh, risk factor for HIV infection, such as traveling or cross contact. There was also no no uh, food outbreak in Taiwan in during the uh, study period. Uh, besides, the HIV positive patient has more <coughs> uh, co-infection with uh, HCV, and uh, they also have uh, more recent uh, syphilis, which is defined they have syphilis in past half years. For symptom and signs, there was no any difference, so we cannot uh, tell from the symptom signs uh, uh, for the HIV between uh, HIV positive and HIV negative patients. The imaging study, <coughs> uh, our patients uh, receive uh, sonography or CT uh, during their uh, acute HIV uh, diseases. And the HIV positive patients had more hepatosomomegaly in imaging studies than HIV negative patients. The, labor the laboratory data <coughs> shows just very similar to the Japan study. We also found that the HIV positive patient <coughs> has a lower ALT and AST when compared to uh, HIV negative patients. Besides, they also have uh, less uh, coagulopas. Uh, we can see the less uh, uh, line of the table. Uh, they, they have uh, fewer <coughs> prolonged uh, prosomic time compared to HIV negative patients. However, in the follow <coughs> in the outcome, we found there was more relapsing hepatitis, which is defined the uh, hepatitis recovered, recovered uh, uh, in the acute stage and then rise again in the co convalescence stage. And the, an, another finding is uh, HIV positive patient has also <coughs> have more prolonged hepatitis uh, than uh, HIV negative patients. So we put the uh, result together in this figure. We can see in the different three stages of uh, acute HIV infection. In the first day, the HIV, HIV negative patients will have a higher ALT than HIV positive patients. However, after two weeks, the HIV positive patient will uh, have more uh, uh, probability to, to still have a uh, higher ALT than HIV negative patients. Until now, all the results is just very like the Japanese study. However, we can do more because we have a very large number of HIV positive patients. So we can, we can uh, perform the subgroup analysis by uh, HIV uh, viral load, CD4, or the use of antiretroviral therapy. In all subgroup uh, analysis, we found uh, if we separate the HIV patients into uh, uh, one with uh, good viral suppression and another with uh, poor viral suppression, which was defined uh, less than 1,000 copies per meal, we can find the, patient, the HIV positive patient with good viral suppression will have higher ALT than, HIV, uh, than, the, than those with poor uh, viral suppression. For the prolonged hepatitis, the, the result is very similar. If we separate the HIV positive patient into good or poor viral suppression, we can find the uh, patient with uh, good viral suppression is very like HIV negative patients. And the, the uh, HIV positive patient with poor, <coughs> poor uh, viral suppression still have a uh, higher chance to have prolonged hepatitis. So in conclusion, the acute hepatitis A among uh, HIV positive patients, they will have less severe in acute stage, such as they have lower levels of ALT and uh, less, uh, less uh, risk of coagulopathy. However, they will have prolonged causes of, uh, of hepatitis. They will have prolonged ALT 
and prolonged viremia, uh, which may indicate they will have prolonged infectiousness. Use uh, antiretroviral uh, therapy with better HIV viral suppression will have beneficial in shortening the disease course and, the, and the, uh, elevate the influence of HIV on acute hepatitis A infection. In our study, we noted a high male to female ratio. So we identified a non-HIV immune MSMR, a, a particular at risk group. Their risk, risk factor include oral anal sex, digital anal sex, uh, use of recreational drugs, and uh, the next one we, we, uh, we conclude is maybe due to the prolonged infectiousness due to HIV co-infection. And this uh, factor will be fixed by early use of antiretroviral therapy with, well, uh, with good viral suppression. We have several limitations in this study. Uh, first, it was a retrospective study, so the timing of uh, ALT follow-up was not uniform. Uh, as we know, HIV-positive patients will tend to be followed up more regularly than HIV-negative patients. Second, the strain effect is, can be addressed in this study. No, uh, genotype 1A is the major uh, strain in this outbreak. We, we, didn't, we did not know if the uh, phenomenon still uh, exists in another uh, uh, genotype. Third, we didn't have the viremia data and the viral shedding data. So the prolonged uh, infection is just, just um, uh, made by uh, prolonged hepatitis. So I would like to thank all the patients and the hospitals participants in this study and uh, all my colleagues uh, helped me to uh, accomplish this uh, speech. Thank you, for the, thank you for your listening. So the paper is open for questions. Mm, I have one question maybe to generate a discussion. Because I see in the two groups of patients, the HIV positive and HIV negative groups, this is quite different, both groups, because you have a really high rate of uh, men having sex with men in the HIV positive group, 94%. And uh, furthermore, you have also a high rate of syphilis and also a CV antibody positive in HIV positive group. So do you think that this difference that can impact your comparison between both groups or not? Thank you. Uh, so. For the first question, uh, uh, the proportion of MSM in HIV negative patients is, uh, is lower than HIV positive patients. Uh, that's because uh, more than 50% of HIV negative patients, we didn't know their sex orientation. We, we did, uh, the, the, the column is unknown because uh, it is the habit uh, in Taiwan doctor uh, always know uh, the patients have HIV and we ask the sex orientation, but if the patient didn't have HIV, there was not a routine question we will ask patient their sex, uh, sex orient orientation. That's uh, the first question. The second is about the uh, recent syphilis and the uh, H HCV co-infection. Uh, indeed, we noted that will cause some bias in uh, in our analysis. So we, we ever perform a sensitivity test. We exclude all uh, HCV co-infection patients and the, the result is still the same. So we did, we did not exclude these patients from our study group. Uh, uh, leading to uh, going to the moving forward to the clinical practice, uh, which is the clinical relevance of having a high peak of ALT levels, uh, since you don't have uh, severe out higher proportion of severe outcomes in patients uh, with HIV or HIV negatives between two groups? Pardon? Which the, the clinical re relevance of having uh, higher ALT levels in non, in non uh, HIV patients? Yes. Since you don't have uh, a higher proportion of severe outcomes like death or liver transplantation, uh, uh, we, we think the higher higher ALT level in HIV negative patients may be due to the immune response. The HIV positive uh, patient they will uh, have uh, lower immune response to 
uh, HIV virus, so the ALT level will be lower. However, due to the uh, impaired uh, immunity, they can clear the virus very quick, so they will have prolonged hepatitis. Yeah. I suppose the, the correlate of that, then there's a potential for transmission that would last longer in those patients potentially, yes. especially if they're still engaging in the risk that led them to become infected in the first place. So it may have implications for the population so, level of transmission. Yes, so we, we encourage uh, the all HIV patients to receive ART early mm -hmm. to uh, reduce the, the uh, impact of uh, HIV on HIV infection. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we've nicely illustrated that a new viral hepatitis is another sexually transmitted infection that we have to be concerned about. And in that vein, our next presentation will discuss hepatitis C virus transmission networks among HIV positive and HIV negative men having sex with men in Paris. And this will be given to us by Thuy Nguyen from France, who's a virologist and PhD student working there. Mm, hello, everyone. I'm really pleased to present to you our work today on the shared CV transmission networks. I just want to say to you that it's quite specialized in virology, so I hope that uh, I will try to explain clearly the clinical message. So just try to listen to me, don't look at your, at your phone. I uh, want to present the shared CV transmission networks among HIV positive and negative men having sex with men by antidip sequencing in Paris. Uh, why did we conduct this project? Uh, you, as you may all know that an increase in SCV incident in men having sex with men have been observed recently and demonstrated by several outbreaks of acute hepatitis C in developed countries. Uh, furthermore, in the HIV-positive MSM, uh, a large fan court reported that an increase in SCV incident from 2010 to 2016 in France, despite a high treatment coverage in France, and uh, a, uh, you know that this population is also considered of high risk of uh, multiple SCV exposures, for example, with a high SCV reinfection rate in Paris. And uh, a large meta-analysis have reported that the pool SCV incidence in HIV-positive MSM was 7.8 per 1,000 percent years. However, in the HIV-negative MSM, this incidence was much lower, just 0 0.4 per 1,000 percent year reported in the same study. But it should be noted that this incident can reach up to 14 per 1,000 person year in MSM with high-risk behavior, such as though included in the ANIS epeg pre-exposure prophylaxis trial. And in this population, we found several SCV transmission networks have been described previously, such as the large European MSM transmission networks in HIV-positive NSM. And two recently published studies have shown furthermore spread of SCV from HIV positive to HIV negative MSM. So the more, more important thing, how can this study define and determine these SCV transmission networks? I just want to define you technically a little bit. A transmission chain is defined when viral sequences of different individuals are more genetically similar to each other than expected by chance and demonstrated by a tight cluster on phylogenetic tree. Uh, technically, this cluster must satisfy branch support and genetic distance threshold requirements. And for HCV, optimally, we sequence the polymerase or NSYB or the hypervariable region of HCV genome. And you all know that there are two available sequencing techniques for us, that is the Sanger sequencing and the deep sequencing. The Sanger sequencing is a gold standard for monitoring of patients, but it is unable to deeply characterize the viral diversity. However, for the deep sequencing, that can enable an extensive analysis of viral diversity. So that's the reason why in this study, we aim to firstly identify and deeply characterize the CV transmission chains among HIV positive and negative MSM in Paris by both sequencing techniques. And furthermore, to a lesser degree, we would like to identify closely related CV transmission events among this population for directness inference. We perform both single sequencing and deep sequencing on polymerase gene, and we constructed phylogenetic tree using approximated maximum likelihood with GTR model, and we determined transmission chains at different thresholds of maximum genetic distance. For single sequencing, we use a 3% cutoff of maximum genetic distance, and for deep we use a 3% and 4.5% cutoff, and we, you will see why. 
uh, we enrolled a total of 68 patients with acute hep C, including 55 patients, 50 HIV positive and 5 HIV negative follow at the three hospitals, and also by their community physicians, and 13 HIV negative patients from the ANIS epac gay trial, that means those MSM under PrEP. And uh, patient characteristics are shown in the table. You can see that most of them, they are HIV positive, with 50 patients are HIV positive, 18 negative. And uh, most of them, 55%, they are men having sex with men. The other 15%, we don't have a lot of information. We, they are reported with unknown sexual orientation. One interesting thing, the, one interesting difference between both groups are the SCV reinfection rate. You can see that the HIV reinfection rate was higher in the HIV positive group compared to the HIV negative group. That can reflect a higher risk of multiple HIV exposures in the HIV positive group. So as you can expect that the first result, we would like to compare the sensitivity of both sequencing techniques and uh, aseptic under deep sequencing allow detection of more HIV transmission chains. However, that not expected that fewer subjects were identified in the transmission chain. Please further take a look at this table. You can see that single sequencing that allow detection of 10, while in the deep sequencing that it allow detection of 11, uh, 17 or 18 transmission chains, depending on the cutoff. However, the number of subjects identified in a chain by single sequencing is just three, while under deep sequencing is two. So this is understandable because under deep, you know, with the high output sequencing data, they allow deep characterization of viral diversity. So at the same threshold of maximum genetic distance, fewer subjects were identified in a chain. Or in other words, you can see that subjects in some transmission chain by under deep, they are grouped, they were grouped into larger chain by single sequencing. But one advantage of under deep sequencing in this study that under deep sequencing allow detection of three and four hidden transmission chains through detection of minority variants and uh, depending on the cutoff, 3% and 4.5% of maximum genetic distance, then this transmission chain that were not noticed at all by single sequencing. Uh, you know, to further analyze the characteristic of individuals included in each chain, we found that HIV positive and HIV negative subjects included in this study, they share the HIV transmission networks. Let's further take a look at this table. You can see that the number of HIV transmission chains, including both HIV positive and negative, 8, 7, 8 over 10 by single sequencing, 9 over 17 by interdip, and 10 over 18 by interdip sequencing at 4.5%. Uh, you know, at least 50% of HIV negative included in this study, they share the HIV, they share the they cluster with HIV positive one. So by both techniques, by both sequencing technique, we see that a high HIV clustering rate among HIV positive and HIV negative MSM communities were detected in our study. Uh, the last part of the result, we would like to further characterize the transmission dynamics among these individuals in one transmission chain. So we define one thing that is closely related to SCV transmission events. Uh, uh, subjects are considered to belong to closely related SCV transmission events if their viral sequences, if the maximum genetic distance of their viral sequences are less than 0.5%. That means these subjects, they have viral sequences really similar or even identical. Uh, in the study, we have five events detected. Here is an example of one phylogenetic tree constructed from uh, viral sequences of two individuals. You can see that the first individual sequences of the first individual, they are presented by the pink circle here, and sequences of the second were presented by proud triangle. And let me zoom in for better view. You can see that red place here that represents sequences with maximum genetic distance less than 0.5%. And uh, the blue class that represent even identical sequences between the two subjects. So our results suggest a direct transmission between these two individuals. However, to make my conclusion convenient to all of you, I must say that we did not totally exclude the intermediary link between the two individuals. But I think that really properly that there's a direct transmission between these two individuals. Last, finally, we, by both sequencing techniques, we found a high clustering HCV rate among HIV positive and HIV negative MSM communities in this study. By under deep sequencing, as expected, it improved discrimination of HCV transmission chains. Uh, however, this technique, it identified fewer subjects in a chain compared to single sequencing because of it allowed deeper characterization of viral diversity. 
Uh, so, is it quite difficult to determine a, cut, a suitable cutoff of maximum genetic distance to identify transmission chain? And in our opinion, uh, for large-scale prevention and rapid intervention purposes, UNDRADIP is not really more useful than single sequencing in this term. Uh, biologically, in this study, we detected some closely related transmission events. Furthermore, we found shared CV transmission networks among HIV-positive and HIV-negative MSM in Paris that raised a need for better screening and surveillance of HIV infection in this subgroup of patients, MSM with high-risk behavior, whatever the HIV status, because we often follow really closely patients with HIV infection, but uh, we ignore someone MSM without HIV infection. And uh, another perspective of this study, we would like to further investigate our sequencing data from this study with uh, the SCV sequences of European MSM to characterize the transmission dynamic of this population, but at the European level. Uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, my uh, ANIS for funding this project and also for my PhD. I would like to thank my virology research team and in some SC10 and trial scientific committee for EPK trial and especially on the patient, doctors, and virologists who have participated in this study. And uh, thank you for your attention, and I am happy to take any question. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for this excellent talk. Did you have clusters that extended long in time? If uh, you have the dates of the yep. acute infection, did yep. some cluster extend in time? In two years, from 2014 to 2016. But they are quite close in patient in the cluster. They are really quite close in the uh, date of acute hepatitis C infection. Yeah. So these methods are very good to identify factors that we already know that these infections are probably linked through sexual exposures or transmission networks. Have they? Have you started to envision how they could be used in more uh, proactively in terms of? population surveillance and interventions uh, in order to rapidly uh, reduce the size of the clusters. Thank, thank you and for your question. Yeah. As I just repeated in the last uh, slide that uh, under deep sequencing, it seemed to be really interesting techniques to identify, characterize the transmission dynamic. But finally, in the large scale prevention, it's not really more useful than single sequencing because it's more complicated. It takes time to analyze it. But uh, finally, you, we detected just smaller cluster of patients. So it's not really interesting in large scale prevention, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, were there any HIV, uh, acute HIV infections yeah. among the, the, the patients who were HIV mono infected? On a patient acute hepatitis C? On a no, no, uh, HIV. HIV. Acute HIV infection among those who were HIV infected? Most of them, I, I, I believe that most of them, they are HIV infected from the long time. They are treated. Some patients, they are viro virological pre-suppressed, and some, they have a, a HIV viral load. But, uh, they are but most some of them were just HIV infected. Yeah. They were not HIV. So did they acquire acute HIV? No. None of them. At the time of screening, at the time of sequencing, they are not HIV infected. Okay. They are just uh, HCV uh, with acute HCV. Hi, uh, my name is John and I'm from Sweden. I, I'm wondering whether you looked into why they got hepatitis C. Was it through sexual relations or through chemsex? Because that's a really good issue, important issue in the, in the European MSM group. Thank you, but honestly, I don't have a lot of data on that population. But most of them, they, are, they have a quite risky sexual behaviors. But uh, for the, I don't have detailed information what kind of transmission route they got from HCV. But most of them, they, are, they, they, are, they have really uh, risky uh, sexual behavior. So I believe that they got the transmission. I believe, I am not sure, but I believe that they got the HCV infection by the, by the sexual route. But with camp sex or not, I don't know. Sorry. I don't have that information. One last question over here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, do you have a suggestion how to best quantify the clustering, also with respect to the sample density you have in the two different groups? You know, like to put a number on, on how, how strong the clustering pattern is. Sorry, but I don't get your question, really. Like can, you, can you just repeat it? Um, yes, yeah, so you said you found a strong clustering pattern, but can you put a number to that, like to quantify it? Quantify what? 
the number of clusters. Yeah. Strong the clustering. The, the pattern, the clustering pattern itself, like the, in terms of an odds ratio, or something like that. The, the, I still don't. I'm not sure that I understand well your question, but we have a high clustering, a CV clustering rate among uh, more than 50% of patients. They are clustering with each other in uh, six among a 68 patient that I sequence. I don't know if I, I have a CV clustering rate. So. I'm a bit worried about the, about the sample density, so it, you might have a higher sample density of your HIV positive individuals um, compared to the HIV negative individuals. So I'm wondering if you can compare the clustering if you have a different sample yeah, density. I, I, that's an interesting idea, but I use, okay. I use think, I used to think about it, but most of them, they are HIV, uh, they have a uh, suppressed virological <coughs> of uh, viral low of HIV, so I cannot sequence the HIV virus. So I don't know if that's your question or not. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move forward for the next presenter. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Luisa Salazar Vizcaya from the University of Bern. Uh, her research interests included mathematical modeling in uh, infectious disease, and she present for us, will hepatitis C transmission be eliminated by 2025 among HIV positive men who have sex with men in Australia? Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I this close first? Uh, so Australia, as many other European countries, has experienced an increase in the incidence of hepatitis C among HIV-positive men who have sex with men, MSM, and this increase in incidence concur with also increasing frequency of condomless anal intercourse with non-steady partners, but also with um, increasing fractions of um, MSM reporting intravenous drug use, which of course remains a major risk factor for hepatitis C transmission. But Australia was among the first countries to provide unrestricted access to direct acting antivirals for the treatment of hepatitis C. And since 2016, um, scale up of DAA for the treatment of hepatitis C is ongoing in, in Australia. There is an ambitious program in Australia called Control and Elimination within Australia of Hepatitis C from people uh, living with HIV called CIS. And uh, the success of this program partially depends on the efficacy of treatment scale-up to prevent onward transmission. The WHO has set also ambitious goals for the reduction of transmission of hepatitis C in HIV-positive MSM. And uh, we wanted to know whether within this context of uh, treatment scale-up, Australia could meet uh, the 80% reduction in incidence goal uh, already by 2025. And uh, if so, under which circumstances could this happen? So what we did in order to address this question was to build a mathematical model of hepatitis C transmission in this population, which we first got to reproduce observations and then to produce uh, scenarios uh, and then to produce, to produce uh, projections of hepatitis C transmission given a range of scenarios. The model we built considers that uh, MSM, HIV positive MSM, could transit between behavioral groups that are defined by risk of uh, hepatitis C transmission. We had intravenous drug use, and we also have uh, sexual practices associated with uh, hepatitis C transmission, which I'll refer to in this context as high risk sexual practices. And intravenous drug use could happen in the context of sex or without the context of uh, sex. I would like to point out here that uh, when we refer to intravenous drug use, because this model is meant to reproduce observed transmission dynamics, the infection rates that we estimate are already uh, affected and, and certainly reflect the eff effects of uh, harm reduction, reduction programs. So we got the model to reproduce uh, ART coverage and also the frequency of practices associated with hepatitis C transmission and uh, finally the, the incidence of um, hepatitis C in the, in the studied population. But the future of hepatitis C transmission actually depends on what happens with behavior and treatment. 
So what we did was to formulate a range of scenarios combining different uh, possibilities for behavior and treatment. So this program I mentioned before, CIS, has already reported a high rate of treatment of 65% per year. We assume that this rate could remain stable all the way to 2025. We also assume that this rate could uh, decline continuously and, and reach uh, 20% in 2025. And we assume a more optimistic scenario where this rate would increase to reach um, 100% in 2025. In terms of behavior, we assume that uh, we assume first no change in, in risk behavior, so basically the same fractions that we measure now, but we also uh, systematically increase the rates of transition to intravenous drug use and to high risk sex until they uh, reach 80% also into 2025. And this is what the model predicts for uh, incidence of hepatitis C in the model population. Blue is low incidence, red is higher incidence, and each panel here shows um, what happens when we look at different uh, scenarios of treatment rate, going from low uh, to high, as I described before. Um, the x-axis shows the fraction with intravenous drug use by 2025, and the y-axis shows the fraction with uh, high-risk sex also by 2025. And what we can see from here is that uh, the model projections were more sensitive to treatment rate than to changes in risk behavior as the colors change more dramatically from panel to panel than they do uh, when we move uh, across the, the axis. The model told the same story for prevalence. But now let's focus on the limit case scenarios that we, that we consider. Um, being the limit case scenarios, no change at all in risk behavior and the maximum and large increases, the maximum change that we consider, as I said before, reaching 80% by 2025. If we look at the trajectory for incidence, we see that when we assume no changes in, in risk behavior, we have very similar trajectories in terms of incidence for, when, for high uh, treatment rate and for a stable treatment rate. And uh, we have also that the scenario with low treatment rate and the performance with respect to those two. But then if we look at the scenario with large increases in risk behavior, we see that after an initial period with, high, uh, with the high treatment rate that has been already reported with CIS, um, the a scenario with low treatment rate, uh, the model predicts for the scenario with low treatment rate, an increase in, um, in the incidence of hepatitis C. But uh, the question was actually about uh, the potential of uh, Australia for um, achieving the 80% reduction target by 2025. And this slide summarizes the answer of the model to this question um, for the scenarios I just discussed, but also for additional variations of them. Green indicates success at uh, meeting this uh, target, and red indicates failure. And what we see from here is that uh, the model it was consistent to predict that um, the goal would not be reached if the treatment rate uh, remained low. For the rest of the scenarios, the point estimate suggests uh, success at, at reaching this, um, this target with the confidence interval, uh, intervals reaching um, farther or, or closer to the 80% reduction depending on the scenario and of course the best case scenario meaning the largest predicted reduction happens when there is no change, or no worsening in risk behavior, and um, a high rate of treatment. I conclude then that um, the model suggests, suggests that we should expect hepatitis C transmission among Australia's HIV positive men who have sex with men to continue, but also continue to decline if the AA treatment uh, scale up goes on. And uh, that, that we predict that this uh, should even happen in the context of increased risk behavior. Um, so, in principle, uh, if this, uh, if the if the treatment rate continues to be high, continues to be as high as now, or to increase, then by 2025, uh, Australia is projected to meet the 80 percent reduction goal. And finally, we plan to monitor the outcomes, the real life outcomes from the CIS program versus the model projections to see what we can learn from this exercise. 
I would like to acknowledge all my co-authors, in particular David Dotica, and uh, everyone, um, the patients and also the workers uh, associated or contributing to data collection, uh, because this is what makes possible this uh, type of exercise. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, it's a nice study showing that GAA can practically eliminate HCV infection among uh, MSM HIV positive. The paper is open for questions. While waiting, uh, I have a question. Did you do any analysis uh, of the, to evaluate the economic impact of uh, treating from 65% to 100% uh, patients with GAA in Australia? Do you know uh, the idea of uh, how it will cost for, for Australia? No, actually, I didn't perform any uh, cost-effectiveness analysis, but given that treatment is unrestricted, then maybe we, we're safe with both treatment rates. But I did not perform economic analysis. Yeah. I guess the other question is, because this differs somewhat from other studies that have suggested that without extensive behavioral interventions, we can't really reduce uh, achieve elimination in certain populations. Uh, is that because the CIS cohort has already achieved such high rates of treatment penetrance of 65% is probably high compared to a lot of other settings? Or is it that the prevalence rate to begin with in that population is relatively low or another reason? Maybe yeah, you could elaborate good. on those. Yeah, so, um, so th there is a uh, so something that we didn't do here was assuming or looking at what happens if um, exposure to transmission or risk behavior decline. We only went for stable to worsening scenarios. But it's uh, what, uh, the reason why the project, one of the reasons why the projection are so optimistic is, is exactly what you mentioned, that we already, so the, we activate our scenarios when already, CIS ha, where already the treatment rate has been so high for, for already a period of time. And in this period of time, we assume that uh, risk behavior also remains stable. But yeah, I mean, the, these, these projections are indeed more optimistic than, uh, than previous, previous studies. Other questions from the audience? We have lots of time. Everyone's being beautifully on time today, so. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for a very clear presentation. Thank you. All right, so it's now my pleasure to introduce my co-chair who will be giving the next talk, uh, who's the only hepatologist on our panel today from Brazil. So he's pleased to welcome Hugo Pereza, who will be speaking to us on HIV infection as an independent risk factor for liver steatosis, a study of HIV mono-infected patients compared to uninfected paired controls and associated risk factors. Thank you very much. Now we are moving from viral hepatitis to fat liver disease. I'd like to start thanking the, to th thanking the scientific committee for giving the opportunity uh, to present this abstract as a horror presentation on behalf of my co-authors. We have nothing to disclose. Clinical presentation of non-alcoholic fat liver disease can range from simple steatosis to advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, and you its complication. Are, aren't okay. And, and uh, uh, to cirrhosis and its complications, such as uh, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and hypertension. The pathogenesis of uh, non-alcoholic fat liver disease relies on presence of metabolic factors, an increase of free fat acid, uh, insulin resistance, and oxidative stress. In the last year, several studies have been uh, describing a high prevalence of liver steatosis in HIV mono-infected patients. The prevalence of steatosis in this study ranged from 30% to 73%. However, uh, we, uh, the, the, the impact of the HIV infections on development of steatosis is still unclear. So the aim of this study was to evaluate the prevalence and factors associated with liver steatosis in HIV mono-infected patients compared to uninfected subjects paired for confounding factors. We assess data from two Brazilian cohorts of HIV patients and non-infected non -infected subjects. Uh, the HIV ELSA is a cohort of 649 HIV mono infected patients who have been followed at our institution in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, 
and the Brazilian Longitudinal Study of Adult Health, it's a court, now that Elsa Brazil study, uh, that have been followed more than 15,000 subjects, non-HIV, uh, uh, in a multi-centric uh, Brazilian study, including six centers in, across the country. We uh, use data from baseline uh, visit from the two courts. Uh, patients uh, were submitted to the same procedures, uh, including clinical evaluation by uh, anthropometric measures, alcohol intake assessment, comorbidity and comedication use, and HIV uh, infection, history of HIV infection and antiretroviral therapy for those from the HIV court. Blood sample was collected and blood tests were analyzed in a centralized laboratory and liver steatosis was defined by a uh, fat liver index, for, uh, fly for short, uh, when equal higher than 60. Uh, fat liver index is a serological biomarker for detection of steatosis. Uh, can be calculated using this uh, formula and uh, that includes GGT, BMI, waist circumference and triglycerides. This serological biomarker was uh, firstly described and validated by an Italian group uh, led by Bedoni. However, uh, in the last years, several studies have been validating uh, this serological biomarker for detecting uh, steatosis, including in Brazilian population, with uh, our curves of uh, 0.76. We used a propensity score method for uh, matching uh, case and control. Uh, the variables used for the matching were selected through a genetic algorithm that searched for the best model fit. Then a propensity score were, was calculated for each patient of both cohorts. And finally, a nearest neighbor propensity score matching with a caliper of 0.05 was used to select case HIV patients and control non-HIV subjects. The aim of this, uh, the use of uh, this methodology was to select really very similar uh, case and control uh, adjusted for uh, several confounding factors. The only difference was the difference was the HIV presence of HIV infection. This flow chart uh, can uh, sum summarize the, the, pr the procedures adopted in this analysis. So uh, as a first step, we did a logistic regression analysis uh, in the HIV court uh, with 649 patients to identify factors associated with steatosis in HIV patients. After that, uh, we uh, proposed a genetic algorithm that uh, used uh, the propensity score for selected uh, control and cases. Uh, we selected uh, control and cases based on the nearest neighborhood propensity score. It means that that was a maximal 5% of dispersion of the standard deviation of the propensity score to select case and controls. That's why uh, we got uh, very similar patients. And uh, so we had at the final 333 HIV patients from the HIV ELSA court and 333 uh, non-infected subjects from the ELSA Brazil study to do the control, uh, case control analysis to identify the risk factors associated uh, of the, the impact of uh, HIV on presence of steatosis. As you can see here, uh, HIV patients and non-infected subjects were uh, significantly different regarding demographic characteristics, metabolic factors, and lipid profiles. Uh, HIV uh, court has a low, lower proportion of female uh, sex, uh, lower proportion of black pardo ethnicity, and lower proportion of uh, high education level. Uh, in addition, uh, metabolic, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome was lower in the HIV infected court compared to the non-infected patient. Uh, however, on the other hand, uh, HIV patients were more likely to be uh, diabetic and had uh, a higher uh, level of triglycerides. That's why uh, we uh, could not uh, compare these groups, but they are so different that, that you can do that. Uh, the prevalence of steatosis in the HIV patients was 35%. In the univariate analysis, uh, age, higher age, uh, B, higher BMI, waist circumference, higher 
prevalence of metabolic factors and metabolic syndrome, higher CD4 count and higher duration of antiretroviral therapy was, were associated with uh, presence of steatosis. Doing the multivariate analysis, male sex, black part of ethnicity, higher BMI, presence of type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, a poor clinical measurement, a higher CD4 and a cumulative HIV viral load were independently associated with presence of steatosis in HIV mono-infected patients. After uh, matching using the propensive score method with a caliper of 0 0.05, uh, people living with HIV uh, had a two-fold higher risk of having uh, steatosis compared to non-infected patients, our ratio of 2.1. So the strengths of this study re re relies on the selection of control in a multi-center uh, study uh, across uh, all Brazil country. Uh, the blood sample were uh, collected and analyzed, were analyzed in a centralized laboratory to avoid inter-observer variability. And we uh, adopted a methodology for matching that uh, could uh, lead us to have very similar patients uh, adjusted for several confounding factors uh, to see the, the impact of HIV on the steatosis. The main limitation of the study uh, is the lack of liver biopsy or imaging methods as a gold standard for steatosis and the lack of fibrosis assessment. Uh, ultrasound, abdominal ultrasound was performed uh, at the baseline visit for both, uh, in both courts for all patients. Uh, all the examens were recorded in a, a high-definition file, and they were sent to a centralized uh, site to be read by a senior radiologist. So we are now collecting this data, and we are going to repeat this analysis using abdominal ultrasound as a gold standard for steatosis that might be a more robust gold standard than fat liver index. To conclude, traditional and HIV-specific risk factors were independently associated with liver steatosis in people living with HIV. HIV infection individual had a two-fold higher odds for presence of steatosis compared to uninfected period controls. I'd like to finish uh, acknowledge all participants of both cohorts, the ELSA Brazil study, the HIV ELSA cohort, my co-authors and colleagues from my institution and other institutions that participate in the study, and the national and international agents that supported uh, this study. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have some questions. Cristina Mussini from University of Modena, Italy. Uh, just a question about uh, NNRTIs, because uh, NNRTIs can elevate uh, uh, GGT, so this could have been an important bias for your formula, I think. So did you repeat the analysis also on the 35% of the patient that were without uh, uh, NNRTIs in their treatment? Uh, thank you for your question. No, uh, I totally agree that uh, GGT uh, is part of the fat liver index, though so, uh, people with HIV had a higher uh, GGT level than people uh, yeah. non-infected, but we did not uh, repeat. We, uh, for the steatosis for only HIV-infected patients, the use of NRTI was not associated with steatosis uh, using the fat liver index, but we did not repeat uh, the analysis in people that were not using NRTI. Yes, thank you very much, Frederick Monson, Lund University, Sweden. Do you have any idea of the prevalence of chronic uh, hepatitis C and hepatitis B in your patients? Uh, we all patients uh, they were they were screened. They only they are only HIV more infected patients, not uh, co-infected with viral hepatitis. And in uh, uh, however, in the our non-infected subjects. We uh, did not. We don't have the data for for viral hepatitis serology. So uh, maybe uh, in Brazil the, pre the prevalence is about two percent of EPC, for example. Uh, so, but we don't have this, this data. What do you see as the clinical implications of the finding? The clinical implications. Uh, 
maybe uh, the, the high prevalence of steatosis in HIV-infected patients is not related to the virus per se, but maybe related to all that comes with HIV infection. So we're going to look for the cumulative use of uh, antiretroviral therapy to see if there is some f something that can uh, uh, be associated with uh, steatosis in this population. We present abstract last year at the AIS, and the cumulative use of uh, the D drugs, the DDI and D40, cumulative use, not current use, was associated with steatosis in another HIV court. So we're going to do the same for, for this analysis. But thank you. Another Hi, question. Trido from San Francisco. Uh, you mentioned that you had collected data on alcohol use, but I didn't see the uh, data presented on um, the, uh, the association of alcohol use and whether that might have been a confounding factor in your findings. Thanks. Yeah, we had uh, collecting data from the audit score, uh, but we don't have, we, we excluded patients with uh, higher than eight uh, audit score. That's uh, abusive alcohol intake. Is it possible that the... Uh, that the that people who drank less than five drinks per day, which is I think the cutoff in uh, the audit C for um, uh, problematic alcohol use, might have uh, have contributed to the steatosis that you found. Uh, we, uh, by definition, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, it's a presence of liver steatosis without abusive alcohol intake. So, we use this definition to 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 define our our simple steatosis by fat liver index as a non-alcoholic fat liver disease. Hi, uh, Ricky Sue from AHF as well as NYU. Um, it seemed like your HIV positive patients had significantly high rates of diabetes and uh, hyperlipidemia and a number of these different agents to treat these conditions, hyperlipidemia and diabetes such as statins, omega-3 fatty acids and uh, some diabetic agents have been looked at to treat liver, fatty liver, and steatosis. I was wondering if you, how you were able to control uh, in the HIV positive patients versus HIV negative patients, perhaps some of the differences in these medications for these comorbidities. Yes, uh, we define it, the, the presence of type 2 diabetes or dilipidemia by the IDF criteria, the International Diabetes Federation. So uh, it was type 2 diabetes defined uh, using of uh, uh, medication or having a high glucose, fasting glucose, and also for uh, uh, total cholesterol and HDL. Uh, I cannot say how much. Uh, I, we, we see that we saw that uh, pe uh, people with HIV they had lower prevalence of metabolic syndrome, but uh, they have higher prevalence of type two diabetes. I don't know if I if I answer your your, your question. I think he was asking about whether the concomitant medications used to treat those conditions differed between the two groups. Were they HIV positive patients perhaps less likely to be treated for well for their diabetes that could have increased their rates? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we saw we had a variable that's a poor clinical measurement, so it was related not only HIV measurement but uh, for for whole for for type two diabetes and uh, dyslipidemia, and it was associated with uh, with. Uh, liver steatosis in HIV-infected patients. Maybe there's, so maybe there's a role for that. Thank you. Uh, we have one last question. Hi there. Lalo Kachai from San Diego. Just to piggyback on the clinical implication of your finding, uh, using non-invasive scores, do you have an idea whether there was a difference in the prevalence of your patients with HIV or without HIV in advanced liver fibrosis using non-invasive scores because I know you haven't done biopsy. Yeah, uh, that's a, a limitation of our study. We don't have at the at the time of the baseline visit. We now we have fibroscan, but we don't have we didn't have fibroscan at this at this time. Uh, we can use the APRI or FIB4 uh, to do that, uh, but uh, it's not so reliable. Uh, the accuracy is lower than fibroscan. Uh, we had uh, our HIV court. We are doing prospectively uh, evaluation of liver fibrosis using Fibroscan, and we have 10% of uh, significantly fibrosis in this population, HIV, mono-infected. But we cannot, uh, we don't have the control, so maybe we're going to do with Fib4. Thank you. I actually have one final question because I think we're all looking for, uh, especially in larger longitudinal settings, uh, non-invasive markers that could be at 
well used to characterize populations where we don't have fiber scan longitudinally or liver biopsy. Do you feel that the fatty liver index is robust enough to do at least some of that um, monitoring, perhaps for planning for interventions uh, that we could uh, look at to improve this high rate of fatty liver disease in this population? Yeah, uh, fat liver index, it was, it was described in 2006. It was validated in Italy and after in several countries. Uh, also, there's a publication of the prognostic value of fiber liver, fat liver index for severe outcomes, such as mortality. So uh, it was related to mortality. Uh, we have also the hepatic statosic index. We have the NFLD liver fibrosis fi fat score. And we have a Brazilian biomarker that is Teto Elza that was developed in Brazil. Uh, maybe we can use this biomarker for longitudinal uh, follow-up, but uh, only fat liver index has a publication that re re associate, that the higher fat liver index was associated with uh, mortality. Great. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much for closing off a, an excellent session. I think we had a good spectrum of liver disease in the population, and thank our audience for their participation.